Ladies and gentlemen, the First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Melania Trump. Thank you for coming and taking a part in what I hope is the first of many conversations we will have in our mission to enhance the lives of children everywhere. My focus has and always will be on our children, the next generation. They are our future doctors, nurses, firefighters, scientists, teachers, chefs, generals, pilots, designers, reporters, and missionaries, just to name a few. As you know, last May I launched my Be Best initiative. Throughout this past year, I've had opportunity to work with many of you, traveling both domestically and internationally in order to promote the three pillars of Be Best, well-being, online safety, and opioid abuse. I know Secretary DeVos has done a great job in providing more opportunities for children in education, and she has been a great partner in helping grow the best message with in our schools. Be best has also worked closely with Secretary Izar and the Department of Health and Human Services, particularly in learning more about the dangers of opioids on mothers and babies. Last October, I had an opportunity to travel to four African countries where I saw firsthand the good work being done through the United States Agency for International Development. I'm glad Administrator Green can join us today. It is with a great appreciation that I welcome all of you for this meeting. I'm looking forward to learning more about the programs available and now and how we can work together to continue creating more opportunities to help and empower our children. I would now like to call on Secretary Azar to share more about the Interagency Working Group for Youth Programs. Thank you. Secretary Azar, please. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Trump, and I'd like to thank the First Lady for her remarks and for welcoming us to the White House today. Uh, the leadership, compassion, and encouragement you give to the young people of this country every day is appreciated and inspires each one of us to think about how we can use our own leadership roles to help America's youth. Your Be Best initiative, concentrating on well-being, social media use, and opioid abuse of young people is timely and has certainly influenced many of the plans and objectives of this working group. Allow me to speak for all of us in expressing our gratitude for your leadership. As chairman of this group, I'd like to give a brief history of this working group, what it does, and why it's important. This group had its roots in the 2000s, when there was a recognition of a need for a more concentrated effort among our federal government programs to focus on helping young people thrive in their families and their communities. In fact, as Deputy Secretary, I attended one of the very early meetings that gave rise to this working group. The working group itself was created by an executive order entitled, appropriately, Improving the Coordination and Effectiveness of Youth Programs. The nice thing about an executive order like that is you do not have to guess at what it's about. Today, there are a total of 21 federal agencies that regularly coordinate and exchange information on the effectiveness of youth programs. Through our Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, HHS, is proud to host the monthly meetings of this working group which includes federal staff involved in youth programs across all of these agencies. The meetings discuss current work, new research, and innovative strategies for improving the lives of our country's youth. I'd like to thank the HHS staff and everyone across the other agencies who have advanced this work over the years, and I'll highlight a couple of those efforts now. One of the most important duties of the group is overseeing youth.gov, a one-stop shop for federal youth resources ranging from information on mental health and substance abuse prevention 
to civic engagement and after-school programs. One part of the site that is especially relevant to this administration's priorities on the First Lady's work is its resources on substance abuse. Our country's opioid crisis is sometimes thought of as a challenge mainly for middle-aged and older Americans. But rates of opioid abuse among our youth have risen dramatically, too. The working group has created an opioid crisis resource on youth.gov that can help people recognize signs of opioid abuse in young people in particular. Many of you are also aware of this administration's deep concerns regarding skyrocketing use of e-cigarettes by young people. Youth.gov also hosts resources on that issue, including materials from FDA's Real Cost Campaign, which educates youth about the risks of tobacco and e-cigarettes. In fact, FDA delivered a presentation on this issue at the most recent meeting of this working group. I also want to highlight two particular policy efforts that have come out of the working group. One is a collaboration between the Department of Labor and HHS's Mental Health Services Agency, SAMHSA, to use the Youth Build program to address substance abuse. Youth Build is an organization supported by the Department of Labor that provides youth with the opportunity to learn construction skills. Youth Build participants must commit to being drug free, but the program was seeing high rates of youth dropping out as a result of substance abuse. So SAMHSA and DOL developed a pilot program using SAMHSA's rapid assessment tools for substance abuse risk to tackle substance abuse in the program. The pilot helped increase graduation rates and reduce expulsions for substance abuse and is now funded by the Hilton Foundation. This working group has also been busy this year on establishing common outcome measures across all 21 partner agencies. The goal is to build a unified set of measures used to assess the outcomes of all of the various programs we run for youth. Are they increasing employability and economic opportunity? Are they improving education outcomes? This is tremendously important and will be helpful to have a common standard. Our mission at HHS is to improve the health and well-being of every American and improving the outcomes for our youth is a crucial step towards health and well-being throughout the rest of life. So we're proud to run this working group and we're grateful to the First Lady for hosting us today. And with that, I'll now hand it back to the First Lady to continue the proceedings. Thank you, Secretary Azar, for sharing this um, important work and the history of this working group and the great youth programs um, within this, this agency. Uh, now I would like to call on Secretary DeVos to share the presentation the Department of Education has pro prepared for today. Thank you so much, Mrs. Trump, and thank you for your leadership on this initiative, and Secretary Azar for your leadership on the working group. Thank you so much. Um, Mrs. Trump, I'm so pleased that your Be Best initiative aims to prepare our youth for the many physical and emotional challenges they face daily. Values like kindness, determination, respect, and positive behaviors online and in person all underpin a life well lived. Each child needs meaningful ways to connect with their school community. And as teachers and parents work to promote positive school climates and create safe and supportive learning environments in their own communities, the department comes alongside to offer support. First, it's important to acknowledge that loneliness and isolation are widespread. Despite technology that allows us to be more connected than ever, at least on the surface, too many students are more disconnected and lonely than ever before. One way schools are fostering connection is through an approach called Positive Behavioral Interventions and Support, or PBIS. The Department of Education has a PBIS Technical Assistance Center which supports school personnel in prompting, modeling, practicing, and encouraging positive social and behavioral skills. One of the Federal Commission on School Safety's recommendations was for more communities to explore whether PBIS might be beneficial for their students. And like the Commission's recommendations, PBIS does not prescribe only one approach. It's a framework local school leaders can use to select and implement specific practices that best suit their students' unique needs. When students learn how to treat each other as they'd like to be treated themselves, what we commonly recall as the golden rule, School climates become more positive, safer, and student-teacher relationships are more trusting and respectful. Schools that take PBIS, PBIS seriously report fewer antisocial and aggressive behaviors, fewer bullying incidents, and major disciplinary infractions, 
and overall improvements in student engagement and academic achievement. I saw this firsthand at Frank Hebron Harmon Elementary School in Anne Arundel County. Students there join in whole group and small group activities that help them build relationships with their peers. I enjoyed participating in one community building activity which focused on how students greet each other. Each day the whole class assembles in a circle and decides how they'd like to greet that day. Part of the greeting decided the day my visit was a fist bump. Another way we can foster safe and positive learning environments for students is to empower them with the freedom to choose the right fit for their education. Florida, for instance, recently established the nation's first tax credit scholarship program for students who have been bullied or who have been victims of violence. No student should be forced to try to learn in an unsafe or hostile environment simply because he or she is assigned there by home address. This administration recently announced a bold proposal to supplement programs like Florida's Hope Scholarship. Education Freedom Scholarships will give hundreds of thousands of students across the country the power to find the right fit for their education. Our bold proposal will offer a federal income tax credit for contributions to nonprofit organizations that provide scholarships to students. Some states may choose to use the scholarships to enhance and improve already existing public school choices. Other states may choose to model Florida's HOPE scholarship program. The point is, it's up to families and communities to decide. When we talk about policies and programs, it's easy to get focused there and forget about people. Armani's story brings us back into that focus. When she was in the second grade, a few kids at Armani's assigned school in Florida ruthlessly mocked her appearance and consistently distracted Armani from her studies. All of this made her sad because when it comes to my grades, she said, I get really serious. Armani's bullies continued to harass her daily. Then one day, another student slapped her. Armani called her mom in tears. She said she didn't want to go back to school anymore. Our mommy, Armani's mo mother had repeatedly tried to get school administrators to do something about the bullying, but they didn't take it seriously either, and they didn't take a slapped face seriously. Thanks to the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship, Armani's now in a safe, happy, and thriving new school. Our mission is a safe family environment, the school's leader said. We see it as a partnership between the home and the school to raise great kids who are successful in life. Armani's new school is intentional about keeping kids from bullying. We talk about kindness first, Armani said of a weekly gathering of students. People talk about what we do and should do in the world. We get it right. Every student needs to be free to pursue the education that gets it right for them, in places and in ways that will unlock their potential and unleash their creativity, so they and we together can achieve our best. Thank you very much. A very important work what we do uh, school to school and I hope we achieve in every state at least one school if not more that they have those programs and we will work hard on it. So thank you very much Secretary DeVos. Uh, and I, I now would like to call Secretary Carson to provide more insight into the great work of strong families. Well I like I'd like to start by uh, thanking First Lady for organizing this event and for your inspirational leadership. And thank all the people involved in this endeavor. You know, having spent my entire previous career dealing with children, uh, this is special for me. She's, yeah, the First Lady is doing something truly great with the best, helping to prepare the next greatest generation, which is an effort worthy of praise. As a doctor, I know that the health of a community is measured by more than just the vital signs of its residents. A neighborhood's heart and soul are its strong families. That's why HUD launched the Strong Families Initiative, a program to strengthen, empower, and improve the quality of life for HUD-assisted families. HUD's mission is to ensure all Americans have access to safe, affordable, quality homes. But that mission isn't just about housing capital, it's about human capital. HUD's Strong Family Initiatives is a nationwide series of events that takes place throughout the year. 
local families receive health, education, and economic empowerment resources, have access to legal and expungement services, get involved in workshops for science, technology, engineering, and math, participate in reading booths, digital literacy training, leadership development workshops, and they have fun. More than a thousand communities have been served by these powerful events which have impacted tens of thousands of HUD assisted families across the country. The Strong Families Initiative began last year as an expansion of HUD's longstanding efforts to promote responsible fatherhood. Fathers not only provide boys with role models and mentors, their presence may indicate other neighborhood factors that benefit families such as low incarceration rates and better job opportunities. By amplifying and expanding HUD's resources for responsible fatherhood and to broad family togetherness, we recognize that perhaps the greatest single determinant of a child's future is the active and loving engagement of all parental figures, including fathers, mothers, stepfathers, stepmothers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, mentors, and more. Having been raised by a single family, a single mother myself, from the time I was eight years old, the Strong Families Initiative is more than a professional source of pride. It's a personal honor to pay back the debt of gratitude that I and countless others owe to families who sacrificed their yesterdays for our tomorrows by paying it forward with tools for all families' futures. At Strong Families events, thousands of books are given away as part of HUD's Book Rich Environments Initiative. Book Rich Environments is a tri-sector collaboration between nonprofit organizations, national government agencies, and corporate publishers that aim to infuse public housing communities across the country with a vibrant and accessible culture of books. I'm proud to announce HUD will be giving away its one millionth book this year to families living in public housing. I was in Florida last summer giving away books and ice cream, and the kids were much more interested in the books. I was <laughs> delighted. <laughs> and in my own childhood, books saved my life. My mother always encouraged reading and made sure my brother and I were surrounded by books. We weren't rich. In fact, we were poor, but books opened up more doors for me than anything else in my life except God. I became a doctor because of books. My brother became a rocket scientist because of books. And today I stand before you as HUD secretary because early on books were passed on to me, just as HUD is passing them on to so many American families that share the same need. When families have books in the home, children become interested in books. Books lead to literacy, literacy to education. If a child is reading at grade level by, eight, by the third grade, the trajectory of their life is changed. Our strong family initiatives is making a lifelong impact on children's education by introducing students in public housing to Project SOAR, S-O-A-R, which stands for Students, Opportunities, Achievement, and Results. Project SOAR is funded by HUD to help young people plan for enroll in, pay for, and succeed in post-secondary educational programs. It is achieved in part by introducing students to education navigators who serve as personal guides and mentors. HUD's achievements in education are reflected in stories like that of Stephanie Sanchez. Stephanie is a young student who recently became the first in her family to attend college. According to Stephanie, her education navigator, Enrique, played a pivotal role in helping her apply for federal student aid, manage the college application process, and stay on top of deadlines throughout her semester. She is now a, kinesthesi a kinesthesiology major in California State University, Long Beach, and she credits SOAR for that success. Again, I strongly commend and applaud the First Lady in undertaking the Be Best initiative. It is said that it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a community to achieve unity. I look forward to working with the interagency working group to serve America's communities with a shared mission and a common vision to promote the positivity of lives and future of America's children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Carson. Very important work.
that you do, that we all do, and your story is very inspirational, and you should be um, inspiration to all the children out there. Um, and as I always said, children absolutely deserve and need loving and strong family. So it's very important um, what kind of uh, support they have from us and from the families. So again, Secretary Aizar, uh, I would like to uh, ask you again if you could share your work that the Department of Health and Human Services um, are doing. Well, um, Mrs. Trump, I wonder, would you mind if Admiral Giroir, our Assistant Secretary for Health, who leads the efforts on the opioid crisis, <clears throat> and especially your work together on the neonatal abstinence syndrome, might be able to tell you a bit about the, the youth work we're doing there? Sure. Hello. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to discuss an issue that is so important to you and important to all of us and that is improving the outcomes of the infants and children who were exposed to opioids prenatally. As a pediatric critical care physician, uh, much like Dr. Carson, this is very personal to me as it is to all of us. As you know and if you, as you have championed, the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome, also known as neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, has increased by over 700% since 2000 between 2000 and 2014. In 2016, we saw over 25,000 babies affected by neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is likely an underestimate because of the inadequacies of diagnosis and awareness. And it also doesn't count all the abstinence syndromes due to other drugs aside from opioids, including methamphetamines. We're all aware of the shakiness, jitteriness, seizures, dehydration that can occur in babies exposed to opioids. But what is much more ominous is the potential for growth restriction, prematurity, or early death, and the long-term outcomes of low birth weight uh, and developmental disorders, which we're now seeing in children. Under Secretary Azar's leadership, the National Institutes of Health has started a historic e effort calling helping to end addiction long-term in America. Important components of this research program include expanding therapeutic options for opioid addiction, overdose prevention and reverse, optimization of effective treatment strategies for opioid addiction, understanding the biological underpinnings of chronic pain, accelerating the discovery and development of non-addictive pain treatments, and most importantly, enhancing the treatments for infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome. There are two major programs that will start this year that will be historic and lay the foundation for our treatment of these children for the next decades. The first initiative is called ACT NOW, or Advancing Clinical Trials in Neonatal Opioid Withdrawal. Although we saw our first patient with neonatal opioid withdrawal in 1875, we still don't have st standard medical practice to know how to best treat individuals with this syndrome. So this study, which will begin this year, will be at 20 sites across the country, and it will test important strategies, including non-pharmacologic strategies, like eating, sleeping, and consoling children, or for those who do need pharmacological treatment, how quickly to wean children, and what children need what treatment at what time. In addition to the treatment part, there will be a two-year follow-up of these children to make sure they're growing and developing normally. In addition to the ACT Not Now study, the NIH will also start this year the Healthy Brain and Child Development Study, which will be a historically important study that will enroll up to 10,000 pregnant mothers and follow them and their children for up to 10 years. This will include about 20% of mothers who are exposed to opioids, but also to other drugs or to adverse experiences. There will be long-term collection about pregnancy as well as fetal, childhood, development, and structural measures, as well as data on social, emotional, and cognitive development. The knowledge gained from this study over a 10-year period will impact our knowledge and treatment ability for those exposed prenatally or postnatally to certain drugs or adverse environments. We will understand finally and definitively the future potential for substance use, mental disorders, 
and other behavioral and developmental problems. HHS will invest $350 million into this study over the first five years. Together, these studies will lay the cornerstone of our national scientific strategy to enable children exposed to substances or other adverse environments to be best. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, this is a life-saving program, and I hope we can find the best approaches uh, to treating infants as quickly as possible. Uh, through BeBest, I have learned about so many programs and uh, traveled the country, and uh, so the treatments available uh, to, for mothers and babies suffering from this crisis. Um, thank you very much again, and I would like to turn over to Administrator Gaynor from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Good morning, Mrs. Trump, morning. and it's, it's an honor to be here today to uh, have two FEMA youth programs considered for the Be Best campaign. Uh, first, let me briefly review the importance of preparing youth uh, for disasters. Uh, children under 18 make up 23 percent uh, of the U.S. population. Every day, approximately 63 million children attend childcare or are in school and away from home and their families. Uh, disasters impact children living across the United States. Almost 14 percent of children and teens have experienced a disaster during their lifetime. 4% have experienced a disaster within the past year. Of those that have experienced a disaster, a quarter report experiencing one or more disasters. Uh, youth programs encourage engagement in preparedness actions, which increases self-worth, positively influences resilience, action, and maintenance of preparedness activities. Uh, first, let me talk to you about uh, one of our first programs called uh, the Youth Preparedness Council. Uh, the Youth Preparedness Council was created in 2012 uh, to bring together young leaders who are interested in supporting disaster preparedness and making a difference in their own communities uh, by completing disaster preparedness projects both nationally and locally. The YPC is made up of 15 members across the country who are selected based on their dedication to public service, their efforts in making a difference in their communities, and their potential to expand their impact as national supporters for preparedness. YCP members meet with the uh, FEMA staff throughout their term uh, to provide input on their strategy, their initiatives, and their projects. YCP members also attend the annual YPC Summit in Washington, D.C., and meet periodically with FEMA representatives and work with several of our emergency preparedness projects. YPC members have presented alongside their senior FEMA leaders at events and conferences, fostered partnerships with other youth-serving organizations, and provided input for FEMA and their external partner initiatives and strategies. YCP members have completed national and local level projects that include launching a youth preparedness coalition, conducting emergency preparedness outreach in tribal nations, organizing conferences and events, founding state, territory, and regional level youth preparedness councils, and planning and executing disaster exercises in their own communities. Uh, students from the 8th to 11th grade uh, can apply online for the next term, which closes on 31 March, uh, and uh, everyone is welcome to apply. Our second youth initiative is called uh, Ready to Help. And I, I have a prop here I'd like to pass down. If you just pass that down. Uh, Ready to Help uh, was launched in September of last year uh, and is a draw format card game that teaches kids how to stay safe, stay calm, get professional help from professionals or trusted helpers, give information to responders, and then give age appropriate care. It is designed to be easy playable, portable, and not relying on technology, AA batteries, or the internet, uh, which is probably <laughs> most parents would welcome. Uh, and we want to reach all audiences. Uh, gamification improves retention and increase adoption of preparedness and emergency response behaviors. Youth are more likely to take preparedness actions, learn through interactive activities, especially games. Ready to Help provides a solution to parents and adults that may find it difficult to talk to their children about emergencies and disasters. With Ready to Help card game, kids have fun responding to examples of emergencies by working together using skills that will help them in a real emergency. Uh, the card game is currently being printed and is free to the public uh, on order, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about either program. Uh, what do you suggest is the best age uh, to prepare the children? Eighth grade, as you said, or I, I even think earlier? As, as early as you can start, I think, is good. You, you've heard stories about what to do when a smoke, uh, smoke alarm goes off or how to dial 911. As early as you can get them prepared, the better off I think we all are. What do you think about the you know, big natural disaster 
what's, um, what is the best age, because they need to understand it a little bit more. Uh, again, I think as early as you can, and some of these games will help, uh, you know, some of these uh, difficult subjects to talk about, but the game, I think, gives a platform to have parents talk about uh, these things to their children. Uh, thank you very much, Administrator Gaynor. As we all know, emergencies are often unexpected, as we experienced uh, recently in Alabama. Uh, and it's important to know what to do when, you, when that happens. It is always impressive to see young leaders within their com communities. And thank you to FEMA for doing an incredible job. We have one final presentation. I would like to ask Administrator Green uh, to share with us the work from the United States Agency for International Development. Thank you, Mrs. Trump, and uh, thank you for your unbending advocacy for children both here in the U.S. and all around the world. Uh, quite frankly, it's, it's very obvious this is personal to you, and we appreciate it very much. Uh, USAID and the Be Best campaign are united in the belief that by investing in the well-being of children, we really and truly are investing in a brighter future. You've hear, heard here today about the great work being done by the Department of Education here in the U.S. to improve learning outcomes for children. And you've heard from HNHS about the work they do to improve health outcomes for Americans. Well, I'd like to take just a few moments to touch upon uh, what we're doing in these and other areas for children and youth all around the world. At USAID, we believe the purpose of foreign assistance must be ending its need to exist. And we believe in the innate desire of every person, every community, and every country to want to craft and lead their own bright future. And because this desire is deeply ingrained in the American DNA, we believe that when our partner countries dedicate themselves to pursuing what we call this journey to self-reliance, well, then we should walk with them along the way. We focus on children and young people all across the world because we know that enabling and empowering them is an irreplaceable part of that journey. So remember, there are 1.8 billion young people in the world today. This is the largest youth population in all of recorded history. 90% of them live in the developing world. You know, sometimes we hear leaders talking about this youth bulge as a problem to be overcome. And of course, all of us look at it as an opportunity to be realized. We know that by strengthening the well-being and opportunities of these children and young people, we can lift their families, lift their communities, and lift their countries for years to come. So what does that look like in practical terms, in programmatic and assistance terms? I'd like to briefly summarize four themes that are driving a lot of our work these days. Humanitarian assistance, education, health, and civic engagement. First, humanitarian assistance and crisis response. Sadly, today there are more man-made, conflict-driven disasters underway than ever before. That also means that there are more women and children on the move or living in zones of crisis. So I'm sometimes asked me what it is that worries me most in the world. It's children being born in crisis zones, raised there, and how that affects them and shapes them as they go into adulthood. So USCID prioritizes investments in conflict and crisis affected children and youth so that when crises, God willing, do wind down, they are better equipped to succeed and to contribute to rebuilding their communities. Our first example is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there's been near continuous war and conflict for years that has disrupted, disrupted educational service delivery. USAID has developed flexible and adaptable mechanisms to intervene when and where these needs arise. Our integrated youth development activity provides vulnerable youth with learning pathways and inclusive economic opportunities, psychosocial support and referral services, and work-based learning and job placement. Of course, we know that education isn't only crucial in times of conflict and crisis. Educated children and young people, 
engaged in their communities are always the best hope for sustainable economic growth and long-term opportunity. So around the world, we improve youth reading skills, strengthen higher education, and reinforce workforce development. Our second example, in Malawi, stop on Mrs. Trump's first solo trip to Africa, there USAID is working with local government on a national reading program. We provided quality reading instruction to more than 4.4 million children, trained and coached more than 48,000 teachers, and supplied more than 10 million new textbooks. As a result, the government of Malawi has adopted our training and coaching model and even extended the school day to allow for more reading instruction time. We also know that children can't take advantage of educational opportunities unless they're strong and healthy. And so we prioritize investments in maternal and child health. Since 2008, through our maternal and child health programs, we have helped save the lives of 4.6 million children globally, the majority of whom live in sub-Saharan Africa. The Trump administration wants to build upon this work. We want to extend it into the future. A third example, in Zambia, USAID supports the Determined, Resilient, Empowered, AIDS-Free, Mentored, and Safe Project, as a better name, DREAMS. We focus on mitigating factors that increase girls' risk of HIV exposure, and we provide them with preventative health services, scholarships, school support, and livelihood skills training. Zambia's DREAMS Center has graduated a remarkable 8,500 and 45 girls and help them to live HIV free and craft a brighter future. Finally, USAID also invests in children and youth civic engagement opportunities because we know that supporting a new generation of leaders, problem solvers, and innovators will help create more peaceful, more stable societies all around the world. Fourth example. To support Georgia's next generation of leaders, USCID promotes civic engagement among youth so that one day they can develop solutions to the challenges facing their communities. Our Eurasia Partnership Program has established youth banks in Georgia to provide community project management and leadership training, as well as financial resources to help them implement the most innovative and exciting ideas. And before I conclude, I want to take the opportunity to introduce Julie Cram, who I know is over there on that side of the room. We recently named her to serve as USAID's Be Best Champion. Julie is the Senior Coordinator of the U.S. International Basic Education Assistance Initiative. So she will continue to promote the Be Best campaign at USAID and identify opportunities for greater alignment between the initiative and our everyday programming. I look forward to our continued work with you at USAID. I hope to get you back out to Africa soon. And I look forward to ensuring that the administration's investments in young people continue changing lives for the better in line with your vision. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Administrator Green. And thank you, Julie, for all what you do, both of you and your team. I would like to ask uh, if anybody has any comments, any suggestions uh, before we closing down. First lady, I want to compliment you on a great effort. Um, I have two little nieces and two little nephews, and they follow uh, your initiative. So it's really hitting at the, you know, at the children's level where it re resonates with them to have self-respect, to take care of themselves, and to dream for the future. So thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Chow. Anyone else? So I just want to thank you again for all of you for being here today and for taking part in this important discussion. I also want to thank all of you for hard work you're doing and representing our administration. There is always an opportunity to do more, and today's meeting is a start. 
I will continue to use BBAS to highlight and promote the successful programs you and others are doing for children in America and around the world. Thank you all again for being here, and God bless you, God bless your families, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you.